All right, so yeah, uh, thanks for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, I think it's really great to uh, that that Nikolai is so open of uh, open to encourage um, the the um, bringing sort of uh, our field up, the single molecule uh, protein sequencing field up, along with the, all the progress that single molecule uh, or single cell uh, proteomics is making. Um, so I'll give a really brief, uh, incomplete primer here on, on sort of general overview of the field and, and, and dive in a little bit into some of the technical details um, of some of the different approaches that people are developing, as well as some of the biggest challenges I think um, are, are, are out there uh, in the near term for, for many of these technologies. <clears throat> Let's see here. Let's click on that. Okay. So... Why do we care about proteins? Well, I think for this audience, uh, this is a slide I usually prepare for the genomics uh, talks. Uh, genomics audience is here, but really, if we're trying to understand, go from genotype to phenotype, proteins get us get us much closer to understanding phenotype and function, right? So proteins really functionalize uh, the genome. Um, and the challenge here then from a technical standpoint is that along every sort of step along the central dogma, the complexity, uh, the molecular complexity gets orders of, increases orders of magnitude, right? Going from transcription uh, of alternative, alternative uh, splice variants, isoforms, these sorts of things, and then post-transcriptional uh, post regulation and post-translational modifications uh, take the you know, proteomic complexity up to millions of different protein, uh, protein variants or, or proteoforms, as, as people like to call call them uh, that can exist with, within a cell. And so this is a really technical challenge, and it's sort of amplified by uh, compared to what the tools that we have for nucleic acids, things like uh, being able to amplify up your molecules um, to, do, to do analysis on them. There's, there's no yet anybody has invented a reverse translation system that can uh, take protein, that can make copies of proteins or convert protein sequences back into, into DNA sequences. And as far as the sequencing approaches, uh, the ability to directly sequence proteins is really, really at a, uh, I would say, compared to uh, DNA and RNA sequencing, it's really, uh, we, we can sort of barely do protein, protein sequencing, um, and especially not at the single, single protein uh, level. Um, and so why single molecule proteomics tools is, is really motivated, motivated by uh, uncovering and identifying and elucidating all this, all this complexity that's, that's occurring, right? So if you have the ability to individually analyze uh, 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 single protein molecules, you, get, you, you start to get some insight into, into all of this diversity and understand biology, right? So, so a, lot of this mod a lot of this diversity is created post-translationally by post-translational modifications. And so you can have a single, single protein molecule that can be modified in a, in a myriad uh, of different ways. And each of these different sort of uh, modification states or, or, or uh, uh, proteoforms can result in very, very different uh, activities uh, that that protein then will manifest downstream. And so you can think about that each protein sort of has its own post-translational modification code. <clears throat> So just take everyone's favorite oncogene here, P53. So this is just a really small subset of known P53 proteoforms. Um, so same, same protein, but there's just different, different combinations of modifications that can happen post-translationally. And each of these different uh, proteoforms can have very, very different uh, activities. And so uh, each of these uh, different proteoforms then represents a novel biomarker uh, uh, or drug target. So, so understanding all these different uh, uh, modifications is, is, is really important. So if we look at some of the grand challenges then that I just sort of, if you summarize here for, for different proteomics uh, tool development, um, so what you really want is really high sensitivity to get at really low abundance uh, uh, mod forms, um, and you want really high resolution um, so that you can uh, uh, get the insight into, into these full length molecules, right? And be able to resolve ideally uh, the, whole, the whole picture, the whole, combinatori the whole combinatorics of that molecule from going all the way from the end to the, end to the C terminal, right? So you don't, ideally you wouldn't want to have fragment that, uh, that protein. Um, and you want it to be quantitative, right? You want to be able to, you know, understand the stoichiometry of these different proteoforms within the cell. And ideally, you'd also have some sort of high throughput approach, right? So you can deal with this really, really high dynamic range of, of that proteins exist um, uh, within a cell, right? From a few copies all the way up to billions of copies of, of, a, of, a, of a proteoform potentially with, within a cell. So if we look at some of the existing uh, technologies right now that are used, that are not sequencing approaches or... The first one is, is actually a sequencing approach here. It's de Edmund degradation, right? So if we look at protein sequencing actually existed before DNA sequencing. Um, 
It was invented by Per Edmund uh, using this Edmund degradation process. We're able to specifically uh, chemically label the C terminal of, of, of proteins or peptide molecules and then chemically cleave it off. And you could identify the, the identity of that N terminal residue then downstream using a, a chromatography or, or, or MS based approach. Um, so, so some of the challenges in sort of scaling up this, this technology is it's fairly low sensitivity. Um, and you need a pure sample, right, to, to be able to analyze uh, um, uh, or, or read out what was that, what was that N-terminal residue on that protein. Um, so it's really not scalable to, to global proteomic studies um, uh, for these reasons. Um, and it's really not why it's not widely used uh, today for, for sequencing proteins. Um, and so the most common method, right, is protein mass spectrometry, um, as, as, as you all know here. Sorry, uh, uh, both bottom up and, and top down approaches. So I think top down is making a lot of progress in getting out these proteoforms, but it's certainly not at the, the maturity of, of bottom up proteomics for, for doing these global proteomic studies. Um, so some of the drawbacks um, that, that single molecule protein sequencing is trying to address is, is that, you know, mass spec is. Some could argue, at least from, from my understanding of the technology, it's not really a, a true, typically not a really a true sequencing approach. Really, it's using a reference database. Uh, bottom up, uh, you're fragmenting the proteins. You're not getting uh, information on the whole, the whole proteoform. Um, and, and, and the instrumentation does uh, uh, require, require quite a bit of, of expertise and, and expense, let's say, compared to uh, next-gen sequencing technology. And hard to scale, what I mean by scalability here, at least in one context, is the multiplexability. Um, I think Nikolai and others are really making progress in, in pushing up the ability to multiplex uh, with, with mass spec. Um, but I think to, for next-gen sequencing, um, it, it, maybe it's not at, that, not at that same level. Um, so just to you know, sort of uh, take the point, drive the point here, here, uh, drive the point home here is that you know, many different uh, proteoforms uh, uh, of, of the same protein, when you're doing this mass spec, you're sort of fragmenting them and getting some sort of a composite identification uh, uh, of the different pieces of that protein. And then uh, not just, you know, sort of compounding that is not just a composite identification, is that you typically don't observe using a, a bottom-up approach. Uh, you're getting really partial sequence coverage, even though you might observe a particular protein, the actual amount of that, that the sequence of that protein that you're actually covering uh, uh, is typically limited. So this is just a survey a few different uh, global proteomic studies, looking at the number of proteins they identified and, and the mean sequence coverages, uh, for most of them, it's less than 30% of that protein. So you're losing, uh, there's a lot of missing information of, of what, what could be going on at other sites along those protein molecules. And then so finally, a uh, popular method for doing uh, proteomics is, is immunobased detection. So if you have a specific antibody for your, for your target, um, that can be a means to, to specifically then uh, uh, detect that protein using various uh, different readout methods, such as, as Western blotting. Um, so some of the downsides of this technology is you really only get to de uh, detect or, or only detect what you're looking for, right? So you need to have a specific antibody for, for the proteoform variant uh, that you're interested in. Um, and it's and for this reason, it's it's uh, it's harder to do discovery using this approach, and it's also very difficult to scale, both because you need uh, unique affinity reagents uh, for them, as well as the readout method. Uh, so you know it's hard to do lots and lots of uh, uh, Western blots. Um, for, for global pr proteomic studies. And I will mention here that I think there are two uh, really exciting developments um, happening with, with two companies that are working on sort of the readout uh, side of things, Olink and, and Somologic, and I think there's a few others where they essentially, uh, if you have specific antibodies to your, to your protein, uh, you can convert your, your readout into uh, essentially a, a DNA-based readout using a proximity ligation or extension technique by having these oligo-labeled antibodies. Um, but again, sort of the scalability problem here is that you need a unique antibody for every different uh, potential proteoform, and it's, it's really difficult to scale. Um, and then antibodies are known to sort of have, it's hard to translate antibodies to different studies or, or different systems, um, and so it leads to a lot of reproducibility uh, uh, problems with, with using them, as it was covered with this nice uh, Nature article from, from a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> so looking at these challenges, we'll, this is where sort of the motivation for single molecule protein sequencing uh, uh, comes in and, and potentially with the ability uh, to address these. And so in 2017, there was the, we had the first uh, single molecule protein sequencing uh, conference was, was convened. Uh, it's funny, it's around about the same time as I think the first uh, um, uh, single cell proteomics uh, meeting. 
Um, ours is only held every two years. Our progress is much slower, I think, compared to compared to uh, uh, this field. Um, but but we are making making some progress. Um, <clears throat> And so around this around the same time in, in, in 2017, 2016, um, and since then, there's been a lot of interest both in the private side as well as the, uh, and, and a little bit in the government uh, side of, of things as far as research funding. Um, so if we look, there's, there's been, you know, billions of dollars uh, has been invested in, in several different companies. Uh, they're exploring different platforms, different techniques to develop single molecule uh, protein sequencing or proteomics tools. Um, and you can sort of break these down, at least I did broke, broke them down into sort of different classes. So we have fluoro sequencing uh, is, is probably the most popular right now. Uh, several companies uh, and most well-funded are exploring these approach. Uh, and Codia is doing a, a reverse translation approach, essentially turning that uh, protein sequencing problem into a DNA sequencing problem. And then there's various nanopore approaches that are being explored as well. And I'll give a deep dive in, in, into some of my work uh, later today doing, doing nanopores. But if we just sort of look at, uh, give a brief overview of how these different uh, technologies work on the technical level and some of the, and then sort of we can think about some of the overlapping uh, uh, challenges that they share, that all these technologies share uh, uh, going forward. So quantum, quantum size, some of you might be uh, familiar with, they actually have a commercially available uh, single molecule protein sequencing uh, device on the market right now uh, for about the last year or so. Um, I haven't seen two, it's sort of, I haven't, uh, the results I think are still waiting to come in as far as the impact that, that their box has, has had uh, on the field. Um, so the way it works here is, is they, they start with their, uh, they can start with a complex protein mixture, they digest it into peptides, and then they uh, uh, um, attach these, these, these peptides into, into wells on top of a semiconductor chip. This is not unlike a pack bio uh, sort of a sensing uh, platform. And then they have a set of N-terminal recognizers here, uh, and each recognizer has a different floor for and, and recognizes a different N-terminal uh, subset of amino acids. Um, and so as you're measuring the fluorescence coming from this peptide over time, uh, it can tell you uh, uh, the, uh, give you some partial sequence um, information because each time one uh, uh, of, these, of these binders um, recognize the N-terminal amino acid, uh, eventually an uh, amino peptidase will come along and cleave that, reveal the next one, and you can sort of measure these colors over time to get some fingerprint uh, of that protein sequence and, and match it to a database. So some of the things that this technology uh, is not addressing, it's still short reads, so you're looking at, at protein fragments. It requires these uh, affinity reagents, um, and it's still fingerprinting because you don't have a unique, uh, as, as it stands right now, they don't have 20 unique binders, or 20 plus if you're looking at, at, looking at PTMs that you would need for, for complete de novo sequencing. Um, Another one is, is Nautilus. So uh, they have a, 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 also using a fluorescence-based binder approach. But what I like about this one, they're actually taking uh, full-length proteins. They don't do any uh, degradation. They load them onto a, a flow cell here. They bind these single protein molecules onto a chip. And what they're doing is using a set of amino acid binders that recognize different trimers, uh, uh, protein sequence trimers that could be anywhere within that, within that protein sequence. Um, and then based on flowing in these different uh, trimers, you can say, you know, protein A had trimer X, Y, and Z, protein uh, uh, two had, had a different set of trimers, and then you can sort of do another fingerprinting-based approach to identify that, that protein molecule. Um, uh, Arisian, uh, so this is founded out of Ed, Ed Marcotte's lab, is, is they're actually doing a, a fluorescence-based approach, but they're, they're labeling, a, uh, they're uh, degrading the, uh, uh, or fragmenting the, the protein into peptides and then labeling the different side chains. And then they're actually doing Edmund degradation on the chip and measuring the, the fluorescence intensity as it decreases. Um, and depending on the color, it tells you which amino acid was labeled uh, and removed at that cycle in the Edmund degradation, degradation process. So again, this is a sort of short read, and, and really the, the, this is really hinges on the ability to uh, orthogonally label uh, uh, side chains with different color, color fluorophores some of the challenges. And then just a brief overview here on some of the, the, the nanopore-based approaches is really the challenges here is how do you control, how do you thread protein molecules through a pore and control their translocation is sort of the biggest challenge in my eyes, at least, at least to begin with, uh, for, for protein sequencing. And these can be broken down into either non-enzymatic control or enzymatic control. We're actually using a motor to, to ratchet proteins through the pore. And, and for any of these strategies, what you're also going to need uh, robust 
uh, N-terminal or C-terminal C labeling chemistries. And I, I do think de novo sequencing is possible uh, using this, this method eventually, but it's going to take a lot of data to, to be able to, to basically uh, come up with the, the algorithms or the computational tools to be able to, to take uh, to understand these complex signal to sequence uh, relationships. And I'll talk more about that today. And then finally, from, from the government side, at least in the US, um, this is probably the biggest investment that I see came from the NHGRI, where they invested in 20 million uh, to fund both single molecule protein sequencing development as well as single cell uh, prote proteome analysis tools. And, and my group was fortunate enough to get one of these awards, and that's what allowed us to really dive into uh, exploring our, our sequencing approach uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so finally, I'll just uh, wrap up here with the last sort of what are the nearest challenges that I see to, to protein, single molecule protein sequencing. So I think there's been a lot of talk um, in the field um, that throughput is going to be a big challenge for single molecule uh, protein sequencing compared to something like mass spec. I don't really see that as, as the nearest term obstacle. I think there's going to be a lot of targeted applications where single molecule protein sequencing can give you a lot more insight and can be complementary to MS that won't require tons of throughput. Um, and I think the ability to multiplex sort of naturally comes with uh, the ability to sequence proteins. Um, so I think if you do have a nice protein sequencing platform, you can multiplex a lot of samples um, by using sequence-based barcoding uh, approaches. And I think there's still a lot of uh, open questions, especially because all these different uh, technological approaches all, all are going to have their own noise, error, and uncertainty profiles. It's sort of how much depth will you need uh, on your sample to be able to uh, confidently identify uh, or say you've identified a particular proteoform. Um, and, and I think there has also been a lot of comparison of uh, uh, next uh, of protein sequencing and, and comparing that to the throughput that we can get with next-gen sequencing. Uh, but in my opinion, I think the throughput for, for protein sequencing can actually be more scalable uh, than, than nucleic acid sequencing. So I don't think setting uh, the limitation of throughput uh, comparing for, for ultimately the throughput for protein sequencing uh, should not be limited to what we're able to do right now with nucleic acids. Um, I think uh, the biggest challenges right now are that we all these technologies are sort of this indirect approach to sequencing uh, the protein because proteins are so hard to work with. We need things like uh, uh, really robust uh, chemistries for labeling, either side chains or N or C terminal. Um, and depending on the side chain, this can be really easy, but there's a lot of side chains we don't have uh, uh, chemistries for. And terminal modification is, th those are pretty well worked out, but C-terminal is, is certainly in its inf infancy. So I think a lot of these approaches would benefit from a C-terminal uh, labeling approach that's more robust and easier uh, uh, to implement. And then also for the uh, affinity-based uh, approaches like quantum sign nautilus, you really, really need these robust affinity reagents. I think it's, I think it's, it's difficult to, to get these. Um, so we sort of look at this big emerging landscape of different approaches, and there's a lot of different approaches that, that I didn't touch on here. Um, and I think at least in the near term, it's, it's really going to take, you know, a village of different technologies to, to address the whole proteomic space because each, because we know that proteins are, are, they're also unique. And, and I think there's going to be a number of technologies, uh, that are, that are going to, uh, complement mass spec and complement each other, um, even within the, the single molecule protein sequencing space. So. Hopefully that was that was helpful uh, for folks to sort of understand um, the perspective on on protein sequencing. Um, and yeah, happy to, to do any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Are there questions for Jeff? I'm curious about the uh, curious about the C terminal uh, reaction because. Obviously, you've got a carboxyl group there, but there are carboxyl groups throughout the protein. Yep. So how are they going to be distinguished? Yeah, so so there is there is one approach. Uh, it's a chemical-based approach that is able to uh, specifically label the C-terminal carboxyl and, and have minimal side reactions with the with the aspartate and, and glutamate. Um, I'm not a chemist, so I can't tell you how, but I do know, I've looked at the reaction. It's, it's like a 24-hour reaction. It's photocatalyzed, so it does... Uh, requires some infrastructure and 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 time uh, uh, goes into that reaction. So it, it's 
it's not not ideal, I would say, uh, but but it's workable. It's workable. Oh, yeah, that's right. yeah. I, I think like en if we had enzymatic approaches to doing these labeling, I think that's that's a way to really increase the efficiency uh, uh, for these approaches. So much like you would do, you know, for DNA sample prep, we're doing you know enzymatic ligation of sequencing adapters to the ends of your your DNA molecules. So I think if we can get similar approaches for proteins, that would be uh, the most efficient way. Uh, really nice overview. Uh, I have uh, some questions, uh, but can you talk about some uh, about the high throughput of the, these technologies and the sensitivity? Yeah, yeah. So, so the so the throughput it really sort of depends uh, depends on the system. So, so I think uh, for these array based ones, so let's take uh, Arisian, they're looking at billions of different. They can spot billions of different peptides on a on a single. Uh, sort of chip. I think it's similar for for uh, quantum uh, quantum psi. It's it's hard to say actually. So they have a paper published in, in Science, and it's really hard to actually look at the number of molecules that they're able to analyze um, in those systems. I haven't been able to get uh, hard numbers on how many molecules they're able to sequence in there. So I think it's sort of open question. Um, I think ultimately it can scale to the billions um, of molecules for the nanopore based approaches. We've done some back of the envelope that we could we could do billions of molecules uh, within within 24 hours. Yeah. So I'll just make a quick comment on this. The number that they know for quantum psi from their lead scientists is that at the moment they're able to count order 100,000 uh, peptides. And of course, they're trying to increase that number. How many they count very much depends on sequences. Some sequences are much harder to fingerprint. So depending on the peptides is going to determine the number of those that are assigned confident sequence. But maybe what Jeff can also comment on is the challenge of delivering the sample to the detectors, because ultimately all of these methods have the ultimate sensitivity of single molecules, but it is generally challenging to efficiently deliver molecules yep. from biological samples from cells to, to those devices. So what are some of the challenges on that side what is the current efficiency and how do you see those being overcome? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think you're completely right. Right, single molecule, you think it has, you know, it does have the ultimate level of resolution and that you can observe single molecules, but that doesn't necessarily translate to sensitivity. And I think the same uh, sensitivity issues that, that mass spec has, I think are uh, are going to be um, uh, the same for the single molecule protein sequencing approaches and that you're really going to have to have um, uh, innovations in the sample prep and how you deliver those those molecules to to the sensors. Um, we I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later today, but like for the nanopore based approaches, I think those could be a pretty amenable to some new sorts of 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 sample prep uh, methods that that could really increase your sensitivity. Sort of this near pore uh, pr uh, cell processing uh, technology, but that's sort of yeah we haven't we haven't got to those uh, uh, limit uh, those issues yet. There's still a lot lots lots more to tackle. Is it possible to uh, sequence the protein using the nanopore technology? Like instead of the fragments, is it possible to get the full length of the uh, protein sequences? Not yet, not yet. So that's 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 what my group is working on, and I'll I'll dive a lot deeper into where we're at. At least my group, uh, where we're at with that approach uh, uh, later this afternoon. Um, but but I think yeah, there's there's a number of different ways to go about pro nanopore protein sequencing. I think it's going to be the the path forward. But yeah, not 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 yet. <clears throat> Wonderful. 